International trade. It's a fun chapter to study. Everyone really cares, even if they think they don't. If we looked at the clothing in our closets, we might discover that none of it is made in America. So we're all involved in international trade. Maybe the car in your driveway is an import. It's a fun subject to think about. There's arguments for and against international trade. I'd like you to know both. And we'll really focus on how to determine if a good is going to be an export or an import, and particularly in calculating comparative advantage. So we'll look at some of these factors and get much more specific as we go. Just some key trade factors. You really don't need me for this. It is interesting to me that we import and export some of the same goods. Our major trading partners are here in North America because of our uh, North American trade agreement that we've historically had with Canada and Mexico. But of course, we trade with countries all around the world. Some of the exports. And some of the imports. I think this graphic is really interesting showing the percentage of total GDP that each of these countries export. Belgium doesn't have a very diversified economy. So of the few things they produce, their citizens use less than 20% of, and they export the rest, which means they're very dependent on imports. United States is different. We have a very diversified economy. So we export less than 20%, maybe 17, 18% of everything that we produce. So we do import a lot more than we export but our economy is more self-sufficient than the countries that are at the top of this graph. So if we're just looking at the world's largest export nations, well in 2018, that's the data that we have, China has the largest share of world exports, followed by the United States, then Germany, and then Japan. So of the top eight exporting countries, that accounts for almost 50% of the total world exports. So when we think about how do we know when a country should trade or what's the incentive to trade? Well, sometimes we can gain from trade, meaning we could produce, we could only produce on our own production possibilities curve but we can consume more than that when we allow each country to specialize and produce what they produce at the lowest opportunity cost and then trade with each other. So when we're thinking about, well, what goods would the United States be best at trading? Would we be best at producing labor intensive goods or importing those from other countries? And historically, we have imported labor-intensive goods because our labor rates are so high in the United States compared to many other countries around the world. So if it's labor-intensive, we'll probably purchase that from another country. But if it's capital-intensive, we have a large amount of capital in the United States. Remember, capital is the manufactured aids to production, everything a business needs to produce that's not people and not natural resources. So we have a lot of capital in the United States, about $100,000 worth of capital for every worker that we have in the United States. So we export a lot of capital intensive goods. We also export a lot of land intensive goods from the United States. Think about all the agricultural products that we export. So we're going to begin to develop a concept of comparative advantage. And it's used to explain the relationship between specialization and international trade. 
When we calculate comparative advantage, we are looking to see which country can produce a good at the lowest opportunity cost. So when we're talking about opportunity cost, we're going to be looking strictly at two goods, just two goods in each of two countries. And we're looking to see in each country, if we make good A, how much of B would we have to give up? The country that has the least opportunity cost, meaning they give up the least amount of B, is said to have a comparative advantage for producing A. So we're going to go through this example. It's the exact same example that's in your textbook. We're making some assumptions when we go through the example. We're assuming that the cost in each country is constant over various amounts of production. We're going to calculate the opportunity cost for both of the goods in both of the countries. So as we start the analysis, we're going to look at a production possibilities curve in the United States and a production possibilities curve in Mexico. And remember, we're just looking at two categories of goods when we do a production possibilities curve. So we're looking at tons of vegetables versus tons of beef. In the United States, their production possibilities curve given in this example is 30 tons of vegetables. We could produce 30 tons of vegetables if we did not produce any beef, or we could produce 30 tons of beef if we did not produce any vegetables. And then it gives a current production spot of 12 tons of vegetables and 18 tons of beef. So to calculate the opportunity cost in the United States for each of the goods, go to each end of the production possibilities curve and see that we could produce 30 tons of vegetables if we didn't make any beef, or we could produce 30 tons of beef if we didn't make any vegetables. I want you to solve for what one vegetable, one ton, but one vegetable would cost in terms of beef and what one beef would cost in terms of vegetables. So to calculate just one ton of vegetables means to divide both sides by the number in front of vegetables, the coefficient of vegetables, which is 30. So 30 divided by 30 vegetables gives us the one vegetable and 30 divided by 30 beef gives us the one beef. So in the United States, if we want to produce a ton of vegetables, we'll have to give up a ton of beef. It's not very interesting, but normally we'd want to do it again, turning it around this time to do the opportunity cost for a ton of beef. But in the United States, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, so this time we'd be dividing both sides by the coefficient in front of beef, but it's still 30. So. If we want to produce a ton of beef, we'll have to give up a ton of vegetables. Those are ones. Let's look over for Mexico. So here's Mexico's production possibilities curve. If they don't make any beef, they could make 20 tons of vegetables. If they don't make any vegetables, they could make 10 tons of beef. Just looking at each end of their production possibilities curve. And their current production spot is four tons of vegetables and eight tons of beef. So we want to solve for the opportunity cost for making one ton of vegetables. So we're going to divide both sides by 20. 20 divided by 20 in front of vegetables is one ton of vegetables. 10 divided by 20 would be a half, right? So one ton of vegetables equals a half ton of beef. So in Mexico, if they want to make a ton of vegetables, they'll have to give up a half ton of beef. Let's do the same thing. Solve for just what one ton of beef, the opportunity cost of one ton of beef in Mexico. So this time we divided both sides by 10. 20 divided by 10 is two vegetables. And then of course 10 divided by 10 is the one ton of beef. So this is what I want you to compare. I want you to see who has the comparative advantage by comparing what a ton of vegetables in the United States 
would be versus what a ton of vegetables opportunity cost would be in Mexico. So I'm comparing those two numbers. So in the United States, if we're going to make a ton of vegetables, we have to give up one ton of beef. But if Mexico is going to make a ton of vegetables, they only have to give up a half ton of beef. So Mexico has a comparative advantage. Mexico can make vegetables giving up less beef. So they have the comparative advantage for vegetables. Sorry, I was trying to write that out. Don't want you to lose track of that term. Comparative advantage. Let's just do ADV, see if I can fit it in. So Mexico has a comparative advantage for vegetables. Now let's do the same thing for beef. So let's compare Mexico's opportunity cost for beef to the United States opportunity cost for beef. So in the United States, if we're going to produce a ton of beef, we have to give up one ton of vegetables. In Mexico, if they produce a ton of beef, they have to give up two tons of vegetables. So the United States has the comparative advantage. Oh, let's abbreviate it this time. Comparative advantage for beef. So every time you solve these problems, it's important that you calculate the opportunity cost for both goods for both countries and then just compare them. Let me go ahead and write veggie or something over here to get that a little clear. If we took this a little further on this slide, you can also see the limits to the terms of trade. We know that Mexico is going to make the vegetables and the United States is going to make the beef. But how much beef would the United States have to trade Mexico? Or how much vegetables would the Mexico have to trade the United States for their beef? We're only going to produce beef it here, but we want some veggies, so we're going to trade. Mexico would be producing the veggies, but they want some beef, so we're going to trade. So let's look and see what a trade ratio could possibly be. So in the United States, we're going to make beef. We'll trade our beef as long as we can get more than one vegetable. If we can only get the one ton of vegetables, we might as well produce it ourselves because that's our opportunity cost. So we'll trade our ton of beef as long as we can get more than one ton of vegetables. But if you look across to Mexico under beef, they're going to be happy to get a ton of beef as long as they can get that ton of beef for less than two tons of vegetables. If it were two or more tons of vegetables, they would just grow their own beef. So can you see that if the United States trades one ton of beef and gets more than one ve vegetable but less than two tons of vegetables, both of them will be happy? So let's say one ton of beef could trade for one and a half tons of vegetables, and that would benefit both countries. We would not trade one ton of beef for a half a ton of vegetables because that wouldn't benefit us. And Mexico wouldn't trade three tons of vegetables for one ton of beef because that wouldn't benefit them. So we know the limits to the terms of trade are going to be between the opportunity cost of the two countries. So the country with the lowest opportunity cost is said to have the comparative advantage. We did all the calculations on the previous graph. So we looked at in that graph a couple of slides ago, we looked and saw the current production uh, spot. So the output before specialization was marked on those graphs and we noted that at that current moment in the United States, the output before specialization was 18 tons of beef and 12 vegetables, but for Mexico it was eight beef and four vegetables. Then we calculated the comparative advantage and saw that the United States should produce beef. If we were only producing beef, we could make 30 of them, but we would not be making vegetables. So we have zero vegetables. And for Mexico, the output after specialization was to specialize in vegetables. So we saw that they could make 20 vegetables, but that meant they didn't have any beef. 
So then that amounts exported or imported. You really have to read your chapter. It's not represented in the slides, but in the verbiage of the chapter, it says assume. It says assume that the trade ratio agreed on was Um, what did I say? One ton of beef equals one and a half tons of vegetables. And further assume that the United States is going to trade 10 beef. Well, if one ton of beef equals one and a half tons of vegetables, then 10 tons of beef will be 15 tons of vegetables. So the United States has a negative sign in front of beef because they're trading that much to Mexico and in return, they have a positive sign because they're getting that much from Mexico. And in Mexico, positive sign in front of beef because they're getting that from the United States, but they're giving up 15 tons of vegetables. So then output after specialization is just subtracting. So in the United States, we produced 30 beef, we traded 10 beef to Mexico, left the United States with 20 beef. We didn't produce any vegetables in the United States, but we traded to get 15 tons of vegetables. And in Mexico, they didn't produce any beef, but they traded us 15 tons of vegetables to get the 10 beef, so they have 10 tons of beef. They produced 20 tons of vegetables, but they traded 15 tons for us, so they have five tons of vegetables after the trade. The most important part of this is looking for the gains to trade. So I want you to see this. Oops, I missed the one, didn't I? Gains from trade. So in the United States, they have 20 beef after, and we had 18 beef before. So that means we had two more beef after the trade, two more tons of beef, than we had before. Before, we only had 12 tons of vegetables. Afterwards, we have 15 tons of vegetables. So we gained three tons of vegetables. But notice it's also a gain for Mexico. Mexico had eight tons of beef before and 10 tons of beef after, so they gained two tons of beef. They had four tons of vegetables, sorry, four tons of vegetables before and five tons of vegetables after, so they gained a ton of vegetables. Both countries benefited. Trade will not happen unless both countries benefit. The benefit doesn't have to be equal, but the benefit has to be there for both countries. This just goes back over, calculating that comparative advantage. So you can just read this summary. We already saw the terms of trade when we looked at the graph and at the chart. So this just confirms what we talked about. Here's what I want you to see about the gains from trade. Look at the United States, A to A prime. We learned in chapter one that we cannot produce outside our production possibilities curve, but we can see here that we can consume outside it. On our own, we could only produce it a spot along that kind of grayed out red line. We were producing at A. We did not get economic growth. We did not get more resources or better quality resources or more technology. That did not happen. All we did was specialize and trade and we were able to consume at that higher A prime level. So our citizens got more goods and services. We cannot produce it, but with international trade, we can consume outside our production possibilities curve. That same thing is true for Mexico. Before producing on their production possibilities curve, they produced at a point like Z. Z prime was not a possibility before specialization in trade, and so the citizens of Mexico also were able to consume outside their production possibilities curve. So when we talk about the case for free trade, I want you to 
concentrate on the mathematical model that shows that both countries will benefit. The citizens of both countries will be able to consume more than they could have if we were trying to produce everything on our own. So when we say promoting efficiency, efficiency in economics is getting a greater amount of output with the given amount of inputs. And so we got more beef and vegetables even though we didn't have more resources. It also promotes competition amongst the companies and countries so that the citizens of both of those countries are getting the best quality and quantity of products. This topic can be confusing, but we're gonna keep it very straightforward and simple. So if a product can be produced in multiple countries, there's going to be a world price. If we produce it here in the United States, there'll be a domestic price. If the world price is greater than the domestic price, then we're not going to be importing that product. We'll be producing it for our own consumers. And since our price is lower than the world, other countries will be demanding it for us. So we'll be exporting that good. On the flip side, if the world price is less than the domestic price, then we're going to want to import that good because we can get it at a lower price. And so we won't be exporting that good, we'll be importing the good. Now that all assumes that we had free trade. If we do not have free trade, if we have trade restrictions, then that world price is going to have, potentially have a tariff added to it. A tariff is a tax on an imported good. All tariffs raise revenue for the federal government. Some tariffs, although they still raise revenue for the federal government, are intended to be protective. It can only be a protective tariff if we produce that good domestically. So if we produce the good and the United States puts a tariff on any imports coming in, then it's a protective tariff. If we don't produce it, it's a revenue tariff. All tariffs raise revenue for the federal government. Tariffs are just taxes on imported goods. Sometimes, instead of there being a tariff to protect a domestic industry, the United States will enact an import quota. So quotas are not taxes, they're absolute limits on the number of a good that can be imported. A tariff can be expressed in terms of a number of units or the number of dollars of a good that can be imported. So uh, quotas are much more restrictive than tariffs. Tariffs add to the price, so that people would have to pay the world price plus the tariff, so that price would become higher to the consumer. But quotas keep that good out entirely once we reach that maximum amount that can be imported. A non-tariff barrier is any sort of government restriction put in place against an import that isn't a tariff or a quota. Um, there are a lot of examples of non-tariff barriers. My favorite one was France wanted to produce their own um, VCRs, if you can remember VCRs. They didn't want the citizens of France to import them. They wanted them to buy domestic producers. So they said, well, we're not gonna put a tariff or quota because tariffs and quotas tend to be retaliatory. So if France put a tariff or a quota against the VCRs coming into their country, they would be afraid that other countries might put a tariff or a quota against French wines or cheeses or other things that France exports into the other countries. So instead, they a non-tariff barrier is another attempt to limit imports but without tariffs or quotas. So they set up an inspection office and said any VCR being imported into France had to be cleared through this inspection office before it could hit a store shelf and they only hired one inspector for all of the country. So of course it was very backlogged and very few VCRs got through that inspector and into the store shelves. Voluntary export restriction is just two countries agreeing amongst each other. Usually these are countries that have very good trade relations like Canada and the United States and so Canada might agree to 
send less of one of their goods over here if in return we agree to send less of one of our goods over there. Export subsidies are always in the news and they're always um, divisive. They're just something that we argue about a lot. So an export subsidy is when the government gives money, a subsidy is money from the government to a private business, when the government gives money to a producer for the purpose of lowering that producer's cost to make their price lower on the world market. The United States frequently accuses China of unfair trade practices because of export subsidies. If the Chinese government is subsidizing Chinese producers, then those producers are going to be able to make products available on the world market at a lower price than the United States producers could compete with because they don't get export subsidies. That's a lot of information, isn't it? So we have a demand curve for a certain good. They're not telling us what it is, but just a demand curve for a certain good. And then the supply of it, the D means domestic. So the domestic demand, the domestic supply. So left alone, the price would be PD and the quantity would be Q if there was no world market. But we see that there is a world market because on the vertical axis, we're given PW, which is the price of the world, the world's price for this good or service. So notice that the world price is significantly lower than our domestic price. So this is gonna be a good that's gonna end up being imported. So at that world price, we see the SD curve intersect at point A. So we would pro be producing in the United States A, the level of A, but people would wanna buy the level of D. So that space, that shortage between D and A would be the imports. If this domestic producer was successful in arguing Congress to put a tariff against this good or a quota, it could be a tariff or a quota, but we've got this plus T, so it's a tariff, then that's going to cause the price to be higher than the world price, but still lower than the domestic. So you see the supply curve SD plus T, that's the domestic supply plus the tariff. At that new supply curve, Notice it intersects the demand curve at point C. Whereas at that price tariff, it intersects the supply curve at point B. So the difference now, the shortage is between B and C. So instead of importing the space between A and D, it lessens the imports to the space between B and C. So increases what the domestic producers are producing. Remember then that the consumers are paying a higher price. They're not paying the domestic price. They're paying the domestic price plus the tariff. So then what are the effects of tariffs? Well, the effect of the tariff is a decline in consumption because it's a higher price to the consumers. If the consumers could have just paid the world price without the tariff, they would have gotten it for a lower price. When they had to pay the world price plus the tariff, then they didn't buy as much of it. Anytime price goes up, consumers don't buy as much of it. So we would have a decline in imports. Remember from the A to D to the B to C, I think it was. All tariffs raise revenue for the federal government. But there are indirect effects that we could think about too. We could think about the effect on the foreign producer's economy. When we lessen their imports, we affected their economy. And then quotas. Remember, quotas were an absolute limit to the number who could come number of goods or services on that particular item that could come in. So it also is gonna decline in consumption. If the quota wasn't there, we'd be demanding more of them. Once the quota's reached, we cannot import any more of them. So the decline in consumption. The purpose of a quota is to increase the domestic production. We can't import so many, uh, let's say Toyotas, if we reach a certain quota. And so that should increase the domestic production of cars, but it will decline the imports.
there isn't any revenue generated from quotas. So we've looked at the case for free trade when we calculated the comparative advantage and saw that both countries benefited when we had the specialization in trade. Both countries' consumers were able to consume outside of a level of each country's production possibilities curve. So if we know that we know that we know that free trade benefits both countries, why don't we just have free trade? There's always two sides to every story. So we have free trade, we know it benefits us, but then there's this case for protectionism. So protectionism is the idea that we might put policies in place to restrict free trade. So look down this list and just kind of pick and choose what you might want to read more about. Um, I think the one that speaks most to me is military self-sufficiency. If another country, let's say Russia or Iraq or Iran, is able to have the comparative advantage for producing ammunition or um, the weaponry or tanks or um, bombing aircraft, that sort of thing, they might have the comparative advantage for producing those things. But do you want to be dependent on what might be your enemy in a war for your ammunition or tanks or weaponry, that sort of thing? Well, no, we don't. So military self-sufficiency is a case of even though we might could consume more of those goods, we'll take lower consumption and produce it domestically so that we would know we would have access to those goods or services in the case of a war. So military self-sufficiency makes sense to me that there are certain products that you might want to protect because the military might need them. The United States economy is very diverse, so that doesn't um, play into our protectionist need. Infant industry, the idea that some, infants are, some industries are just infants and maybe you want to protect that industry until it has time to grow up and be able to compete on a world market. You'll need to get a definition for dumping. So dumping is selling a good or service in a foreign country cheaper than you sell it for at home or maybe even less than the cost to produce it. That's considered an unfair trade practice. Generally, the idea of dumping is another country selling their goods over here for less than the cost to produce it and less than the cost they sell it for at home. The, the motivation behind that might be to per, put our domestic producers out of business. And once they had a monopoly on that good or service, they could then raise the price. And then what you hear most about is this increasing domestic employment. Uh, the auto industry is one that we hear about so frequently, petitioning Congress for more tariffs and more quotas um, against the world, uh, the world exporting their cars into the United States, so our imports of cars. That affects how many cars that Detroit, say, can sell, and so they lobby for those protections so that they can increase the domestic employment of auto workers in the United States. And then we began to look at the trade agreements. So we want to spend just some time here, but they are actually more information given about each of these in the uh, succeeding slides. So these are different organizations who govern trade. Let's look at them. So GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. When it began, there were just three, 23, I'm sorry, there were just 23 countries at the beginning of GATT. And the purpose of GATT was to get together and try to reduce the amount of tariffs and the amount of quotas, all the different trade barriers in place, and encourage this non-discrimination, equal trade amongst all of the countries. That grew and it grew and it grew, and I think there's a hundred and, I don't know, 63, I think. Um, you can easily Google that, don't hold me to it, but from that 23, I think there's 163 of the World Trade Organization. So GATT morphed and became World Trade Organization. Oh look, 164 member nations in 2018. So there's still the overarching goal of reducing all of the trade restrictions. That will never happen, that they completely disappear. So just reducing the trade restrictions, 
but when it morphed into the World Trade Organization, it got more power. There's now 164 member nations, so they oversee trade disputes and even rule on those. For example, uh, when Bush put a 25% tariff on imported steel, steel coming into the United States, steel workers really lobbied Congress and said, we're not going to have a steel industry in the United States if you don't put a significant tariff because we can't compete on the world price. And so Congress put a 25% tariff under the Bush administration and the rest of the world went to the WTO and said, uh, I don't think so. We can't compete with a 25% tariff. I mean, most tariffs are in the neighborhood of 3 to 5%, so 25 is really, really big. And the World Trade Organization did uh, rule against the United States. They can't make us change our tariffs, but they can shame us into doing it. So the European Union. The European Union started out as the common market in 1958. I think there are 28 nations in the European Union. And the goal is in Europe for trade to be as free amongst those 28 countries. This is what you hear, have heard so much about Brexit, Britain getting out, getting out of the European Union. But the goal was to make trade completely free amongst those 28 nations. And they've been very successful at that. But it also has a lot of restrictions in uh, how things are made and how employees need to be treated and just um, more restrictions than Britain wanted to comply with. So they have spent years trying to get out of the European Union. The Eurozone is a subset of the European Union. So the Eurozone is a group, a few of these 28 nations who have given up their native currency in favor of the Euro. For example, Britain was always a part of the European Union since 1958 but they never gave up the British pound. So they were not a part of the Eurozone. Whereas Germany is a part of the European Union and they gave up the German mark in order to just be a part of the Euro. So this is the process of changing. We've had the North American Free Trade Agreement since 1993 between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. The same thing, establishing we would like it to be a free trade zone, but it really isn't. It's just a reduction in trade restrictions. There are still tariffs and quotas amongst all three nations, but there are far fewer than there were before DAFTA in 1993. Under President Trump, he's re-evaluated this NAFTA agreement, made some changes so we don't call it NAFTA anymore. Now it's the United States, Mexico, Canada trade agreement. Um, it's essentially the same. There are more uh, protection for workers in Mexico under the USMCA. There are a few more restrictions with respect to the percentage of an automobile that has to be made amongst these nations um, in order to qualify for the reduction in tariffs and quotas. When NAFTA was passed back in 1993, everybody thought all oh, the jobs are going to go to Mexico. It's going to be awful. It's going to be the worst thing that's ever happened. And that just is not how that played out. For the whole decade after and even longer than that, um, unemployment in Mexico, unemployment in the United States, and unemployment in Canada went down. The NAFTA trade agreement was good for all three countries. It enhanced the standard of living in all three countries. And then this last word. You know in the chapters there's always some sort of a fun thing in the very end. And the petition of the candle makers is really fun if you'd like to read it. It's this argument where um, someone writes this letter to the French parliament and said, we need your protection against an unfair trade practice. There's this foreign competitor who's coming in that the candle makers have to compete with and there's no way for us to compete. We need your protection. And when you finish reading all of the argument, the competitor was providing their light for free and they wanted restrictions against that competitor. Well, that turned out to be the sun. And the argument is that we sh everybody should be required to have these heavy room darkening curtains so that the sun could not get in to compete and then they would have to buy candles from the candle makers. <laughs>
there was never a serious argument on that part. Bastiat, who wrote the, um, and I'm sure I mispronounced that, but who wrote that petition was trying to demonstrate how he felt ludicrous the argument was to argue for trade protection that there would always be someone able to provide it for cheaper or better than you can. And so we should encourage that competition, not try to keep it out.